Hi guys, thanks for coming back for another edition of Just Getting Started. I am Susie Schuster and today is a day that I was actually nervous before we taped this conversation with the great Leslie Visser. I was her intern in 1994. I got super lucky. There was an ad uh, on the wall at Columbia looking for an intern for CBS Sports. I went downtown because at the time 116th Street, downtown 50th Street. It's not downtown, it's midtown. I thought it was downtown. I snuck past the security guard and a guy named Brent Andrew interviewed me. I BSed a little bit. I got the internship and I found myself three months later on a flight that my mom paid for to the final four. And this is the year the, uh, the Arkansas Razorbacks won. My brother had to tell me the starting five on a Delta cocktail napkin. And I got to be an intern for CBS Sports. And what happened changed my life. This is how I got started. Leslie Visser took me aside. She was wearing a red blazer at the time. She always wore a power red blazer. And she took me under her wing. She taught me the ropes. She gave me her number. We didn't have emails. And she said, stay in touch. And here's the best advice you could ever have. She said, turn off the TV, watch games without sound. If you know what's going on, then you're good enough and you know what's happening. She said, but be organized and be prepared. Never be afraid to ask more questions and know your stuff. Leslie Visser is the reason why I'm sitting in this chair today, and she is going to be my guest on Just Getting Started. I'm going to take a minute and read to you her accolades, because this is bananas. Voted the number one female sportscaster of all time by the National Sportscasters of America. Visser's in seven halls of fame. I mean, seven. Was named a Muhammad Ali Daughter of Greatness and won Billie Jean King's only Outstanding Journalist Award. She is the first woman to be enshrined in the, in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, the first woman to report from a Super Bowl sideline, the first woman on Monday Night Football, the only woman to have presented the championship Lombardi trophy at the Super Bowl. She was the first woman NFL analyst in both radio and TV and the first female sportscaster to carry the Olympic torch. She's the first woman to win the Sports Emmy Lifetime Achievement Award, the first woman to win the BFOA Lifetime Achievement in her 45-year career. What she hasn't done? Come on, just getting started. Leslie Visser and my conversation with her is next. As promised, Leslie Visser. I mean, you guys have to understand the pressure that I feel having this conversation with you, Leslie. This is almost like giving your dissertation to your professor after this many years. You've come on the Rich Eisen show with me before, but this is intimate. Podcasting is different. And I'm so excited that you're joining us here on just getting started because I got started because of you. So I guess we start by saying thank you, thank you, and thank you. <laughs> I'm so thrilled. You know, usually we're someplace where there aren't lights all around us and we're leaning into each other and having a really great conversation. So, I, you know, I'm thrilled to do this with my buddy. Yeah, it's amazing. And Leslie and I are working on an incredible project right now documenting the history of women in sports broadcast that'll be coming to you sometime soon. We're developing it right now. And it's, it's really exciting to do this with you because of our relationship and because we've gone back for <clears throat> years and it's, it all starts with you, Leslie. And I, that's why I thought the perfect guest for just getting started for everyone out there who's trying to find their way and trying to find something deep within to invent themselves, to reinvent themselves, to find their way. I know your story inside and out because I've been lucky to be by your side for so long, but I want to take you back and maybe teach people about where you began. What is your earliest sports memory? Oh, uh, gosh, it had to be. Um, I grew up with the, I'm just that much older than you that I grew up with the miserable Red Sox. So it was going to Fenway. Um, I was probably eight years old, and my older brother, Chris, uh, we went, we used to go to games when we could, you know, sit in the bleachers, take the bus, and uh, I just remember learning, you know, six to four to three, and I, I, that's my favorite play, double play in baseball, but um, I've carried a journeyman pitcher, Ike DeLock, nobody knows him, right? Everybody else has Mickey Mantle cards or whatever. I had Ivan Ike DeLock from Highland Park, Michigan, our journeyman pitcher who won about 14 games when he at his best a year. And he was a reliever when he started. And he must have waved to me or something in the bleachers. And so then Ike DeLock became my guy. So <laughs> that was, uh, yeah, that was my earliest memory. Isn't it so funny how those moments 
become indelible in your brain, that first moment of connection. Maybe that's where we get that love or that passion, the first spark, the first idea that I can do this. It's that connection. Is someone, even if for me, it was Jim Rice, for you it was Ike DeLog. I mean, we always had our own things um, that would connect us to the world of sports. So then what happened in your life that brought you to realize that you could find your way through sports journalism? What was your first step? Well, I think like you, um, we had the great fortune of being born in Boston. I mean, my childhood was Ted Williams, number four, Bobby Orr, and Bill Russell. So, uh, you know, I just, it was championships. The Celtics did not lose until I was in high school. (laughs) Yeah, it was ridiculous. And on Halloween, I would dress up as Sam Jones, who we just lost a few months ago. But I would draw the number 24 on my little white T-shirt and try to learn a bank shot. So, I mean, you know this too, Susie. In Boston, three things are important. Uh, Politics, sports, and speaking. You know, it's like, I remember at the Boston Globe where, you know, I started, I didn't take the floor unless I had something interesting or funny to say, because words are our theater in Boston, I guess, maybe closest to London, you know, where uh, that's what we major in. So I really, I knew I wanted to be a sports writer from the time I was 10 years old, nine or 10 years old. And my family had moved uh, quite a bit um, when I was younger, and we were living in Cincinnati, And my mom, one day, she was a teacher, and she said to me, I was about 10, and she said, what do you think you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a sports writer, which, of course, was a job that did not exist for women. But she created the whole template of my life. She didn't say, oh, you can't do that. Girls don't do that. She said, that's great. Sometimes you have to cross when it says don't walk. The name of your book, which by the way, for any of you out there is the easiest and greatest read because it's written in your voice. And that's, that's such a gift. I think so many writers don't understand that you can write like you're having a conversation. We'll circle around to this later on in the podcast, because I learned how to write by watching you to write conversationally, like you're having a conversation. That's what the book is like. The whole book feels like you're talking to me and that it's intimate it's a relationship. It's, it's almost like having a back and forth only you're the one that's the listener, which is the kind of neat and special feeling about it. You're right. It's the Tip O'Neill school of oration, right? That you learn in Boston and you, you show that through your book, but you also show that through so many years, both on TV and in print. But we talked about this actually last night when we were just kind of conversating. Normally it's your dad takes you out in the back and has a catch or your mother was a gymnast or what have you, but you didn't have that. So much of your love of sports came from within. Where did you find that and how did that develop? Yeah, thanks for asking that. My dad, as you know, was from Amsterdam. Um, He wasn't Jewish, but he grew up under the Nazi occupation, but but he knew nothing uh, about sports. Uh, So, and my mom did like sports. She, um, my mom actually... Her idea, I mean, Catholic grammar school, Catholic high school, Catholic college, and her idea of Jesus was Bill Russell at the foul line, which I've never told anyone before. I mean, it was whacked. But uh, clearly, you know, it was great to grow up colorblind. And um, I, I always thought sports, maybe it came from moving all the time, but sports is such a great meritocracy. You know, it, it doesn't matter how much money your father has or where your mother went to college, you know. You hit the jumper or sink the putt. Oh, God, we have to talk about Tiger Woods. And um, it's it's such a great meritocracy that maybe that was something that wherever we moved or growing up in Boston, I saw so much of what sports um, did for a city, for a people, for, um, you know, in- integration. It was, I think, um, Bill Bradley, the great Bill Bradley said, the locker room is the ultimate laboratory. And I always thought, yeah, that's true. I mean, Dave DeBusher was the son of a saloon owner. You know, Bradley was from Crystal City, Missouri. You know, they were from all over, from Earl Monroe. And so so I, I do think that. I think I liked that about sports. It's very inclusive. And also, I think when you feel left out or you don't feel like you're a part of something or you don't know what to talk about, you talk about sports. I mean, it really, it's a... 
you're right about how it links people together, but I think from a sense of insecurity, it can make you feel included in something. If you know about, if you knew what was happening with the Red Sox, you could talk to anybody. I always say that, you know, my older brother, as you know, Scott got me into sports because he needed a battery mate and I was a natural battery mate being his younger sister. But you had to know about sports in Boston or they kicked you out. I mean, it's literally dogma. And that's what's part of what's so special about growing up in Boston is that you are weaned uh, on the Boston Globe. You are weaned on the local sports. It's what made cheers work, you know, is that underlying anger of the Bostonian or anybody within greater New England, because half the time you're just angry. And then when you were winning, you were still kind of angry because what if you don't win again? And I think that there's something very special about that Northeastern development of sports. And clearly it got programmed into you. What was your first start, Leslie? What was, what got you started for real? Well, I remember, um, I went to high school in the Berkshires and I, you know, we had a school paper and by the way, when I went to high school, it's going to sound like the 1800s, but do you remember that women's basketball used to be there were six people on a side and two could cross midcourt, a rover. I was a rover. I'm not kidding. I know you picture like the 1800s, the women in bloomers or whatever. Or whenever you wore in... skirts? Right. No, we bonnet. wore, no, we wore, <laughs> we wore these like bloomer things. But, um, I, I asked if I could do a couple stories for the school paper. And even then I knew it was just wrong. It was like, what does the quarterback's girlfriend do on a Friday night? Like that was the story. And actually I was the quarterback's girlfriend. <laughs> but uh, when I got to Boston College, I went right to the paper and um, fantastic, you know, especially to work with people like Mike Lupica. I mean, really, it was a talented staff. Bob Ryan had been there, as your guy Lou Pellegrino knows. It was, um, you know, we were this little consortium of people who cared about the written word. I never thought about TV, never, never. And uh, I, I went, I applied for a Carnegie Foundation grant my uh, sophomore year, and I won it. It, it was... Um, People might not believe, but in 1974, 95% of all white collar jobs were men. So the Carnegie Corporation offered this grant for women who wanted to go into jobs that were 95% male. So like a woman from Johns Hopkins got it for ophthalmology, a woman from Michigan got it for archaeology, and I got it to be a sports writer. <laughs> so I went to the Globe uh, in the summer, and um, it was fantastic. I... Um, they, they started me, uh, they hired me when I graduated. I worked in the summer. And then, okay, let's see. People love embarrassing stories, right? So, okay, here's one. And this was, unfortunately, uh, the Globe made me the first woman to cover the NFL as a beat. And um, the Patriots were not the gold standard that they are now. But they were really good the year I covered, first year I covered them in 76. So they had a coach, Chuck Fairbanks, who was like this stoic Scandinavian from the Midwest, he'd coached at Oklahoma, Colorado. So um, let's see, before, uh, oh yeah, before the Patriots played Miami, who were great then, right, the Dolphins of the 70s, uh, I said to Chuck Fairbanks, um, well, who's going to start at left tackle? He had two players, uh, Tom Neville and Bob McKay. And I said, well, who's going to start? And he said, well, neither one can play the position. So I go driving back to the Boston Globe. I'm going to win a Pulitzer. The coach of the New England Patriots says nobody can defend Steve Grogan against the Miami defense. I drive back a thousand miles an hour in my AMC Pacer. Look like a little baked potato, all glass. I, oh my God, this is the greatest, right? So the Globe comes out the next day and it's, you know, huge headlines, right? Coach says neither one can play the position. My phone started ringing at 5.30 in the morning. Words you don't read in the Bible. What the F? What the F is wrong with you? I said, either one can play the position. Oh, oh that's brutal. Brutal. Oh. It was the end so of my career. You? I was 21 years old. I called Will McDonough, like any right-thinking person. I was crying. I was sobbing. I was like, Will, what am I going to do? Will said, you, to use one of your words, you get your ass down to practice right now, and you get there before everybody, and you stay there all day, and you take it. Unfortunately, the joke went on the entire year. I know. Can you imagine that? 
first of all, going to Will McDonough is like going to the the Pope for absolution, which I guess it really was for football absolution. But but what you did set probably the course for the rest of your career. You showed up. You showed up. And I think so many people are so afraid to admit that they're wrong or to say I was wrong or even to show up. So many gotcha people these days, they write lots of things that are incendiary, but they never show up at a court. They never show up at the field. They never go to a practice. It's very easy to attack people or even say, make a mistake from the safety of your screen. But the fact that you went there and the fact that you said I was wrong is probably, if we want to psychoanalyze, one of the reasons why you went on to become who you are. You set the groundwork that you stood by your word and that your word was, like you said, words words matter. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. I did, I mean, I've had the privilege. I've been, beat, I've been a beat writer where you have to show up every day. I mean, not just for the Patriots. I was Rick Pitino's beat writer when he was at Boston University, which was amazing to see where both our careers took us. He's still a great friend. But um, it was like at BU, he could try all those presses and everything that he's now known for because 400 people were going to the game. You know, you're in a city with the Celtics. Nobody's going to go to the BU games. And people weren't reading my game story, so I could try things. But, uh, yeah, I, I really have felt that um, I'm accountable. You can get a hold of me. So, and I've made, you know, one good thing is I'm an example that you too can survive great humiliation. Well, we've, we've all had it. I had one of those with the Kings one time where I asked about a line change and, and, and uh, the, the coach looked at me and he said, you don't know anything about hockey. Why are you even here? And, and literally I thought to myself, and luckily I had just... I had just studied, like the, something that you taught me. Leslie taught me, by the way, when I was 21, to go home, watch games without the volume on. And if you don't know what's happening on the court, then you need to go study. That was my dogma growing up and going throughout my career. So yet again, thanks, Leslie. And I said to him, and I had the perfect comeback. And he had to go outside and apologize. He had to apologize in front of everybody. But that feeling might my blood drained. I mean, I've never felt so cold in my life. I was so embarrassed. I was so humiliated. It was, it was horrible, but it taught me the lesson of thank God I'd prepared. Yeah. Thank that, God I'd prepared. That is, um, that's, you know, I have these three non-negotiables for people, male or female who want to get into it that, uh, I think you need passion, right? If you don't love it, don't do it. Do something else because you'll get mad. Somebody else is making more money or someone else got an assignment. I think you need knowledge to your point. Knowledge is unassailable. If you're, if you know that you know what you're looking at, you can see Syracuse's zone. And if you haven't learned that zone after 40 years, <laughs> then that's on you. You might want to switch. Yeah, you might want right. to, or you know, you should be able in football to tell the difference between a three, four and a four, three. But, um, I was always had such an attitude of gratitude being, the first so many times that I used to bite it back, the humiliation. But one time I really came back with it. And it was at a Monday night football game that the Patriots had. The first time I met Howard Cosell and, um, you know, he always was showing off, right. And big personality. And so somebody introduced me. Of course, I was the only woman in the press box and he looked at me and he said, open your coat. And, and I was like, what? I guess he wanted to see what a young girl looked like or something. He says, open your coat. And I said, huh? Take off your toupee. That's right. That's right. And I was so proud of myself. <laughs> but I got to know him later. And he's really, he was such an interesting man. Toward the end of his life, I used to um, go have breakfast with him on Madison Ave. So he became somebody that I knew. But um, yeah, that was like the only time I felt okay, I'm just going to step up to the plate here, give it back. Now I'm starting to feel like if I look at my life, I cannot get over listening to your stories. And I always learn new stories every time I pick up the phone with you, or I don't know, I guess do a podcast. I'm sitting here thinking, oh my God, I cannot get over how much of my life has lived because of you. I mean, I guess I had the courage to fight back so many times when something like that happened. Mm -hmm. And it must've been how how you taught me. It's, it's pretty incredible. Guys, I know you're listening and you're thinking, God, Susie, get over this. But sometimes you do these podcasts and it's not until you're in the moment 
that you feel that real connection and you feel like you said, a, um, a, an air of gratitude with this, because I, I listened to that and I think about some of the times that I had had to push back and I guess I got that all from you, but that's a whole different conversation and I'm going to have to send you a present. But you know what, Susie, you had it from the jump, seriously. I mean, even when I knew you, you were 12 years old as an intern at CBS, but you did, you had, I mean, you had, confidence from your, what is wrong with my earpiece? You had confidence um, in your intellect, you know, and uh, you had confidence that you grew up, you know, you knew sports, you followed sports. So I think, uh, I don't know, I think things worked out for you because of who you were. I don't know. I, I'm just sitting here thinking this is really cool. Anyway, I want to go back to Boston and I want to go back to your first jobs. When you walked into the Globe either as an intern or when you got your first job, what was the reaction from the guys in the, in the newsroom? Because newsrooms are notoriously difficult. Oh, for me, it was like, um, you know, that what was the book heaven is a playground for me. Heaven is the Boston globe sports department. Um, they, we were, they were the 27 Yankees, every single person we win every year, right? The greatest sports section in America. And every single person was the best at his position. Peter Gammons was the best baseball, Bob Ryan, best basketball, Will McDonough, best football, Bud Collins taught America tennis. He's the person who taught America how to follow, how to watch tennis. So I think they were great to me because they were so secure in their own, you know, each one had a slice of the pizza that, um, and they were the best that they were. Our columnists were Lee Monfil and Ray Fitzgerald. I got Dan, as you know, Shaughnessy and Kevin DuPont and I were the high school writers when I first got there. So it was, everybody was comfortable and it was a hang. You know, one thing I lament now of uh, being around press boxes is that people don't hang. It doesn't seem to be, you know, we'd all go to Runyon's, we'd all go wherever it was and you'd talk ball and you'd tell funny stories. And I don't know, I, I, that, or maybe I'm exaggerating it in my head, but I don't think so. I don't think so. I remember run-ins only too well. And also, you're right. There was you, you, you do your work. This is what I, again, when I was a kid growing up and I used to pal around with Dan Shaughnessy and he would let me tag along and go to games with him. He loves you, Susie. I hope Rich isn't listening. Um, oh my God, he's had a crush on you for like 30 years. Yeah, don't worry. Rich isn't listening, so we don't have to worry about that, okay. right? Oh, <laughs> notice she didn't deny it. It was that Rich isn't listening. listening. <laughs> don't worry. He's not listening. He's just okay. going to pull a good, he's going to pull a good clip and put it on the Rich Eisen show, and then we're going to move on down the road. But you know, we used to go, we used to go out. He would file his, 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 he'd send me to the locker room. I'd get my quotes from Willie McGinnis and Chris Slade and Drew Bledsoe, who I just thought was dreamy. And, and then he would file and then we'd go have some drinks and, and people would sit around. That's what you did. It's a great sit Cause you couldn't, it you couldn't sitcom. come right down after a game. You know, people had to, um, uh, Keith Hernandez was just, um, telling me this morning how, that was part of the problem when that whole culture, they were all into the drugs is that you just can't, you can't finish a game at 930 at night and then just go right to bed. So yeah, for us, it was, it was Runyon's and you could dissect everything that you'd just seen and, you know, people would kick it around. I don't know that part of, part of the greatness of our jobs is that camaraderie, I think. And that's missing. You're so right. I mean, really, let's, let's, I guess, Leslie, we don't have enough to work on together, but that's our next sitcom is that 80s or 70s Boston. I think, I guess maybe it would be 90s. Who knows? 80s, 80s Boston sports hangout. It's like cheers again. We've talked about this before, but you're right because it really was a sitcom. PJ Clark's was another good place to go in the, you know, after doing a Yankees game, you go over there. Best sit jukebox, mm -hmm. you have to say, best jukebox. You know, it, and that's one thing, like, because of our jobs, you know, most people, I, I was privileged, I rode John Madden's bus with him. I did all the Madden summer all games. And John used to say, you shouldn't be able to run for president unless you've traveled America by bus. And, you know, we would, if John would see light, we'd be going through Utah, and if he'd see lights in a field, we would stop, and it might be girls softball or Little League baseball. And it's it was such a, um, I don't know, a, yeah, I guess it was a, a privilege to ride around and just to hear his comments. I remember once we were on our way to a 49er game, and John's looking out the window, you know, the bus is bouncing along, and John turned back and he said, dark chocolate, I don't get it. It's like they got halfway to milk and quit. <laughs> like that was his brain. 
Who was the most impactful relationship you made in sports? Of course, you were there at his party. Well, I was yeah, there at his I, party I was... because you could, because for everyone listening, Leslie had a way of making sure that every woman who came after her in sports was included. And that doesn't happen a lot. And I know. For but wait, can I tell the story Please. of the party? Please. Oh, God. Okay. So, um, John, one year, John lived in, famously lived in the Dakota, where, of course, John Lennon had been shot and Leonard Bernstein, Lauren Bacall, all those people lived there. So John would park his Madden cruiser when he was on the East Coast out in front of the Dakota. And so John, one year, said, um, you know, for Christmas, I want to give you a night on the Madden cruiser and all your girlfriends can come and Dave and Willie, the two drivers, they can take you around to bars in New York. So uh, we go over, as you know, to the Dakota, 25 girls. John's idea of hosting this Christmas cocktail party was to give each of us a paper cup. And he went around with a bottle of Jack Daniels, right? Everybody got a shot. And then John walked us out. We all got on the bus. And people just have to picture this. As the bus is uh, turning on to Central Park West, you see John Madden in the middle of the road yelling, if all you single girls cannot get lucky riding around on the Madden Cruiser during Christmas week going to bars, you are losers, losers. And he's yelling this as the bus is pulling away. And I remember because it was my first shot of whiskey ever. And there, there was nary a cheese plate to be seen. Like it really wasn't. It was it was more like a, a a pickup than a Christmas party. Right. It was like you said, it was the paper cups, the whiskey. And, and, and not even a bowl of, of, of Tostitos. It was, it was, it was booze or bust. But, but, it was, <laughs> but Leslie, you know, just you set the table by in, being inclusive. And where did that come from? Why did you get that instinct right away to be inclusive? Most women are not. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think it went back to moving around a lot as a kid where you're always the outsider. So I must have somehow said, if I'm, you know, if I'm ever on the other side, um, then there's enough pieces of the pie for everybody. You know, it's, I think we learn in seventh grade, maybe that it's you or me, like if you and I both love Billy or Sally or whoever that, um, okay, it's going to be you or it's going to be me. And, um, I don't, I don't know, but yeah, it always was important to me that there are enough pieces of the pie. But there's a confidence that, that comes from that. And I guess that goes back to what you said in the very beginning, that if you've done your work the right way, you don't have to be intimidated. You don't have to worry that there may not be enough room. You're not, maybe you don't feel insecure about your position. When you started in television, what gave you the possession and the security in yourself to be able to make that transition without all the work behind. So many people spend years and years honing their craft to get on television, small markets and what have you, and you didn't. Yeah, that was uh, a real um, challenge. I went right from the Globe. I didn't you know, get to go to Des Moines or Albuquerque. Uh, so I went right to CBS. And um, my first assignment was the iconic Laker Celtic series. I mean, just insane, right? And I covered enough uh, NBA for the Globe, but I had no TV experience. And I remember, um, you know, of course, it was uh, game three out in L.A. where uh, Bird said we're playing like sissies. So the next game is when... Um, McHale clothesline Rambus and totally changed the series. So after the game, uh, you know, I say... Now, first of all, I look like I had rigor mortis. I mean, I knew what I was looking at. I knew, you know, but I didn't know TV. So after the game, I just remember I say to Mikhail, so what happened in the fourth game? <laughs> like this, right? Like I'm at the SALT agreement. And, and of course we know what happened in clothesline Rambus. And it changed, you know, brawl practically broke out. But Ted Shaker, our great producer, said, Leslie, just be yourself, you know? We... We know who you are, and you know who you are. So, um, you know, just um, trust trust who you are. Trust who you are. That's actually just such simple and easy advice. It's very hard to put into play, but it's simple, and it really... 
Well, how did you feel when you first, I think TV, it's, it's not natural to have somebody talking in your ear, you know? It, now um, it is. Now with right. three kids, two dogs and several jobs, I can hear every conversation in the room at the same time. If I go to dinner and I'm really bored listening to the wife because I really want to talk to the guys about what they're talking about, which is usually football. I sit there and I nod, but I hear the conversation because I'm so used to having a producer screaming at me in my ear. I will say the first time, the first time I ever did a live game, I had a screamer, you know, a screamer guys. It's when you have a, an inexperienced producer who gets nervous, nothing worse than having a producer who's nervous in your ear. Right. And I remember it was, um, it was, uh, it was at Oregon state at UCLA in the Rose bowl. And this is when, um, TJ Hushmanzada and, um, and Chad Johnson were the, you know, were, um, playing for Oregon state. I knew they were going to be good. I knew Chad was going to be good. I didn't know it was going to be quite that good. And it was my first live shot ever. And I started the live shot. I remember I was talking about Corey Poss, the quarterback, and he started screaming, screaming, because he hadn't closed the mic for me. So he started screaming at somebody in the truck. And I kept going, but I, I thought I was going to throw up. And then he kept screaming like, run to the gym. Stop. No, wait, no, no, wait, no, forget it. Run this way. And I was like, oh, like I look like a video character. And at the end of the game, I honestly thought I was going to have a heart attack. My first ever on air, Les, I, um, I wrote the piece for Fox sports. Cause you know, I lied. I told them I had on air experience. I totally lied. They hired me. I get out here. I went to go do a piece on the angels. I didn't shoot a stand up. I was too nervous to shoot the stand up. So when I got back, they said, well, where's your stand up? And I said, Oh, you know, I think stand up should only be in there if you really need to put yourself on camera. But I feel like I was getting the point across with what I wrote in my interviews. They said, Susie, <laughs> we Susie. have to see you. So I went to the Rancho Park Golf Course on Pico and <laughs> made it look like it was Anaheim to do my first one. What about you? What was your what, what was your what was your besides the McHale story with obviously the clothesline? But how did you get used to it? Oh, I went through a couple a couple of tough times because I was learning on the job at the network level at events that everybody was watching. And um, in 1992, uh, CBS um, had me. I'm still the only woman to have ever handled the trophy presentation, and it was when the Redskins beat Buffalo. And so uh, the owner then was Jack Kent Cook, for people who don't remember, very uh, charismatic, uh, very wealthy, owned the Forum, owned the Kings. Um, do you own the Kings? We own the Forum, we own the Chrysler Building, and he owned the Redskins. And um, so at the trophy presentation, and now you and Rich know this so well, and anybody else who's in broadcasting, never give up the mic, right? Never give up the mic. So um, I'm asking, you know, it was Joe Gibbs was the coach and Tag Lubu the commissioner, and now it goes to Jack Kent Cook. And Jack Kent Cook, now it goes, as you know, 150 50 countries or something, and um, Jack Kent Cook starts talking about when he sold Britannica's door-to-door -door in Canada, which is a long way from the Redskins beating Buffalo. So um, my uh, Bob Stenner, our producer, is yelling in my ear, Get the mic, and Bob was not a screamer, but get the mic out of Jack Kent Cook's hands. So all around the world, they saw this kind of tug of war thing going back and forth. It was totally ridiculous. But um, yeah, I don't know. You, you you learn as you go. Speaking of Jack Kent Cook, are you watching Winning Time at all? Are you watching that the the Lakers Celtics kind of drama at all? I have such mixed um, feelings about that because I had Jason Clark, who plays Jerry West, on as you know, I do a podcast. Everybody does a podcast, right? So um, he had reached out before it to Jerry West, who wanted no part of it. And now that I see it, of course, I understand why Jerry West wanted no part of it. But um, it is, it's um, scripted, right? You have to get over that it's scripted. It, certainly, if you know the people, it's not um, the way we knew those people or envisioned. What do you think of this? Someone told me, isn't it interesting that the Celtics of that time were commemorated in books by like Dan Shaughnessy and Lee Monfield and Bob Ryan. Okay, then um, you get to Chicago, and that was um, Mike Tolan, your buddy, our buddy's last dance. And then you get to L.A., and it's a scripted wild series. Of course it is. But but so I'm so happy to talk about this with you. I, I hate how they portray Jerry West. I, I don't think it's fair 
to dramatize Jerry West when he's given so much to basketball and is such a kind and good person. How similar was the era to what we're seeing on the show? My great fear is that people are going to think that um, that is the way Jerry West was, which is um, he was intense. He was competitive. He was, you know, a private man from West Virginia. He, by the way, was not from Cabin Creek. They just wanted to rhyme Zeke from Cabin Creek. He was from like three miles from Cabin Creek. But um, yeah, he was not this maniac stalking the practices and I don't know. So he, um, he just, I don't know. I feel really bad for that. But my fear is that maybe people see scripted series and they don't, they don't move along that this is scripted. This is drama. Um, maybe it could have been, I don't know what the difference is. Some are influenced by, uh, this clearly was not based on, but, um, yeah, my fear is that people are going to think, is that what Jerry West was like? What was that series like? Oh, it was, it was everything. It, I mean, it's still considered, I think, one of the three greatest, if not the greatest NBA finals in 84. Uh, the 84 games were finally Magic and Bird, who had not met since 79. It was the clash of cultures. Boston, you know, they were candidly white and they were, it was McHale, Ainge and Bird. They were, you know, guys that, um, you know, were kind of um, bologna sandwiches, grilled cheese. On the other side, you had the glittering L.A. You had Showtime. You had, I mean, they had Stevie Wonder singing the national anthem. They had the Laker girls at halftime. You know, Red would roll out a few balls on a cart on a cart at halftime. So you had so many underpinnings to all of this that um, uh, just made, and you had the styles, and um, they had so many Hall of Famers. On both those. So uh, that series was just tremendous. Game seven, Jerry West didn't come. He never went to game sevens because he'd lost six titles to the Celtics. So he didn't even come to the garden. Then in 86, when they met again, the Celtics, of course, beat Houston in, they beat the Rockets in 85, but now it was back to the uh, Lakers again. So that was wild. And that was the one that Bill Walton came to the team. Bill Walton was the Celtics sixth man. And he, he said that he got out of Clipper hell. You know, he had Donald Sterling got out of Clipper hell and coming to the Celtics was his salvation, even though he was half broken down. And just to show you how great he was and that team was, ML Carr picked up Bill Walton at the airport when he went to the Celtics, and the first thing Bill Walton did was drive to Robert Parrish's house to tell him, I am not here to take your job. Wow. And when Parrish went into the Hall of Fame, he asked Bill to be his presenter. So that was wild. Who was your favorite of them all to interview? Oh, I loved Magic, you know, and I loved... Um, uh, I actually didn't get to know Parrish till after. He never talked to us. He didn't talk to anybody. But I mean, Bird was a riot. You know, Bird was. Um, uh, I did a Super a Super Bowl commercial um, for. Uh, how about this? They called, and um, first they called me personally, and they said, "Leslie, do you want to do this?" Was the Super Bowl in like ninety? Remember they played horse, Larry and and Magic. Okay, so they called and said, "Leslie, do you want to do a commercial with Michael Jordan and Larry Bird for McDonald's for the Super Bowl?" And I said, are you kidding me? I'll pay you. So my agent was like, what? You just cost yourself so much money. But it was one of those ones where they played horse. And it was um, through the goalposts, near the bench, off Leslie Visser's head. And it was unbelievable. And they had to do it a million times. They'd rented out the old orange bowl, painted it. You know, McDonald's had huge money. And uh, Larry couldn't say my name. I'd known the guy for 20 whatever years. And he, so it would say, you know, through the bench, near the goalpost, of Elizabeth Visser's head, cut. No, Larry, you have to say Leslie Visser's head. So like I had a migraine, you know, by the 18th take. Ridiculous. I mean, that's a ridiculous memory to have, Leslie. I mean, to be in one of the, probably the biggest commercials in the history of television. I mean, that, that not being hyperbolic. I mean, I remember that so well because I had Magic and, and Larry on the back of my door in Dartmouth, Massachusetts, I'm just saying, but also because that translated everywhere. The NBA became a huge sensation with that with that partnership of Magic and Larry. I mean, I mean, who didn't try to imitate Magic Johnson saying, but Larry Bird? I mean, it was just, there was something so fun and 
friendly and intimate about that crazy rivalry. What was it like to cover that in person? Because all of us can just sit back and watch it on television, but you were right there. Well, the culture was so different. Everybody flew commercially. Every, everybody did, including the players. And, uh, you know, I remember after, uh, remember, um, Nicholson gave Mikhail the choke sign at the end of game two. There were 18 seconds left. And of course, everyone thought it was over, but then that's when Henderson stole the ball and the Celtics won in overtime. Well, the next morning, we're all on the flight to LA, including Jack Nicholson. And I remember the movie was Terms of Endearment and he did not even look up. <laughs> he did not look up once at the screen. And then, uh, after game six, the loss in LA, which brought back to game seven in the garden, uh, Larry Bird was sleeping on the LA, on the LAX concourse waiting to board the flight. That's how different the culture was. And nobody went up to him. And now every, everyone would have had a, a phone crept in and taken a selfie with a sleeping Larry well, Bird. They, they wouldn't be near him. Mm. Oh, if that were the case now. Yeah. But I remember once, I mean, things that come back to me that just show how distinct the cultures were. Magic one time told me that he said to Vladi Divac, Vladi, in this country, we don't smoke at halftime. <laughs> I mean, isn't that amazing? That and, and he, and by the way, as, um, as you will attest, interviewing Vlade, you always got a, 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 a delicious whiff of body odor mixed with cigarettes and oftentimes a little vodka too. I mean, you never knew what you're going to get well, when you interviewed him. Sweating was the worst. Like Walton claims he was one of the big sweaters, but I mean, I had Patrick Ewing Ooh. after post game, Moses Malone. I mean, Rivers, Rivers. Yeah, Carl Malone was one of those guys that you you almost asked him to towel down before you interviewed him for fear of <laughs> of being shellacked or coated with sweat. Um, Leslie, when what was the moment that you realized I made it? Oh, I don't think I ever had that moment. My most profound was um, CBS Ted Shaker sent me to the fall of the Berlin Wall. And that was just, you know, one of the stories of the century. And as I mentioned, my dad had grown up in the Netherlands and they were under the Nazi boot for five years. Um, Rotterdam was bombed in 40, liberated in 45. So for me to be at the fall of the Berlin Wall and see people come through that Brandenburg Gate from East Germany. Um, I just can't tell you. It was just so profound for me. Um, yeah, I would say that, you know, I mean, being on the field for some pretty major Super Bowls, you know, were great. Um, I had one funny story that uh, I worked for a little while. You did, too, for Real Sports. And they sent me to Shanghai for a week it was the first interview Yao did before he came, before he entered the NBA draft. And um, as you know, when you do a story in a communist country, it's very involved. You have the government minder, you have the interpreter, you have somebody else watching over you. Of course, I would have somebody like you, there's a producer. So there's just all these people. So every question has to go through all these people, right? Would you ask Yao, and then it goes to three other people, and the translator, and then it goes back and you get the answer. The very last day, the last question I asked Yao Ming was, he made uh, $20,000 for the Shanghai Sharks. And so my last question was, Yao, you're about to enter the NBA. You know, you're going to go from making $20,000 to, and he cuts me off, looks at me and says, I'll get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess the whole week was, you know, like a joke. How do you remember everything so well? Uh, I had a secret, you know, I had mentors many, and thank you so much for calling me one of yours, but um, I had a lot of mentors, too, that happened to all be men because they were not women. But one of them was the great Red Smith, who was uh, the first sports writer to win the Pulitzer Prize at, at the New York Times. And um, Red had a tradition at the Kentucky Derby. He would ask a young writer to walk the infield with him. And that was before it was corporate. It was just all college kids. You know, they had their booze in shopping carts. And so one year, Red asked me, which was, you know, like being anointed, and we're walking through the infield at the Derby, stepping over kids who passed out. And Red said to me, Leslie, I have one piece of advice for you in your career. Wherever you are, make a memory. 
And I did. So I have those postcards in my head. I can see Yao saying it. I can see the people coming through the Brandenburg Gate. So you would stop and allow it to imprint in your mind. Exactly. Exactly. I didn't, even before I knew I would have to ask questions, you know, I, I wanted to make a memory of uh, what was happening at the end of the final four, you know, Jim Valvano running around or what was Derek Wittenberg doing who claims it was a pass. Of course it wasn't, it was an air ball, but I, I wanted to have that for myself. So, you know, I have, I have lots of those. I, I, I've kept them. For so many more stories, guys, listen to In Conversation, Leslie's podcast that she has with SiriusXM because she has incredible guests on. She mentioned Keith Hernandez, but also she shares a lot of stories like this. I want to be cognizant of your time because it's, you know, there's nothing worse than having an interview that never ends. So do you have a couple, like two or three more minutes? Yes, I do. And I would say one thing is um, the best... Uh, Besides my mom and what Red Smith told me, and you've heard this a lot before, but people should really try to imprint this, I think, on, them, on themselves, is, of course, you've heard the great Billie Jean King, who won 20 Wimbledon finals, right? Singles, doubles, mixed doubles, always in the Wimbledon final. And she was asked, what is the pressure of always being in the Wimbledon final? And her answer changed the chemistry of my brain. She, she looked like she didn't understand the question, and she said, are you kidding Pressure is a privilege. So what about the pressure that you felt, though? It may be a privilege, but it's pressure nonetheless that you've been the first of everything. You've been the first woman in the NFL Hall of Fame. Every broadcasting award, this year you're being honored at the Emmys. You were the first to do everything. You were the first woman, as you said, to do a trophy presentation and the last, by the way. You were the first woman for, and we read the list of accolades before you came on, but how do you rationalize that within the pressure that you had and yet you performed at the highest level for so long? Uh, I, I think in the beginning I was probably protected by my innocence. But, um, you know, then um, I guess I would get these assignments, right? First woman on the NBA finals, first woman on the final four. But it had to come also from men taking a chance on me. Ben Story at the Globe, Ted Shaker at CBS, uh, the late, great Jack O'Hara and Dennis Swanson, they made me the first woman on Monday Night Football. Um, John Walsh, your buddy, too, at ESPN. So I guess, um, you know, I, it, it couldn't have happened if they, you don't land on Normandy by yourself. Did you ever um, get any, oh, she's a woman? Did you get any feedback like that or any pushback? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There was, uh, let's see. Um I don't want to read you or any other broad in the Boston Globe. Uh, Dale Murphy, who everybody cherishes, probably you and Rich are great friends with him. Uh, he said it was a playoff game in Atlanta. If she comes in the clubhouse, I won't talk to anyone. So, um, I, and so, you know, you're made the bad guy there. So thank God for Peter Gammons. A couple other people stayed outside with me in the dugout. They didn't go in either. But yeah, sure. There were all kinds of, uh, the wives hated me. Like, Did they really? Because be the after. wives are tough. Ooh, they're the they're tough. tough. Tell me, tell me about that. Well, since there were no provisions for equal access, I did you know my interviews in the parking lot where they were after a game with their families picking up their husbands, and I was just standing there, you know, waiting. And they they I mean now I get along now I know quite a few of them, but then it was kind of like well what 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 could she possibly want to be covering sports for? So. Yeah, no, I have, I have a really, I have a healthy amount of scar tissue. I just don't choose to feature it. Yeah, well, it helped that, you know, it's so funny. The, the joke, I remember, I'm trying to remember who it was that said to me, she was drop dead beautiful and had really great legs, but she also knew what she was talking about. I remember thinking, well, in what order is the import there? Is it, was it the legs or was it knowing what you're talking about? I mean, let's, let's, um, you ha I always say you have to go for dark humor sometimes because if you, if you can't laugh at yourself and you can't appreciate the dark humor, then what's the whole reason of going through all this? In, in all of your awards, in all of your accolades, which one means the most to you? Well, I would say, and it's um, I'm being presented to it. I don't know if you'll be in New York. I hope you will be. But in May, the uh, I'm the first woman to win the Sports Emmy Lifetime Achievement. And thank you. Good. <laughs> thank you. Um, it's, uh, well, fingers crossed for Rich, right, too? 
your guy. It would be Always nice. Always nominated. Yeah, yeah, yeah he, said, he said he's the Susan Lucci of the Emmys. But anyway, keep going. <laughs> God, he is so great. And he makes it look easy. You know, the best ones make it look easy. That's why they are the best. Yeah. But, but um, this one's really important to me because uh, the former winners are people that either I worked with or I idolized. The first winner was the great Jim McKay. Uh, who, of course, our chairman at CBS, um, Sean McManus, it's his dad. And uh, then you go along, and it's like um, Kirk Gowdy. Of course, I grew up listening to Kirk Gowdy on cheap transistors doing the Red Sox. So it's, uh, and they're all storytellers. Jack Whitaker, John Madden, uh, Dick Enberg, Vern Lundquist. So I'm deeply, deeply moved by this award. Who's the interview that got away? Oh, um I would have loved uh, to talk to Obama about college basketball. <laughs> I would have loved that. Um, I have regrets that I didn't cover. I never covered um, the Tour de France. I always thought that'd be so cool, see them riding up the Champs-Élysées at sunset. I mean, I have a lot of people I would still love to interview. Um, Kareem was always difficult for me until you talked about jazz. Um, but... Uh, and Arthur Ashe and Billie Jean were probably, I guess, for me, the most satisfying because Billie Jean, I think when Billie Jean beat Bobby Riggs, that was the seminal moment of the women's movement. You know, it was gender equity, financial equity, plus she was Billie Jean. And Arthur Ashe just lived a life of such grace. Talk about pressure. What would you have done if you didn't do this? I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine. I, I mean, I think of myself as a writer, so probably writing you know, would have been in there, but, um, I'm, I'm for whatever role model I am for women, I'm an honorable one. I really love sports and I knew how to communicate it. So I think this is, you know, maybe advertising. I don't know, except that's not real sometimes. No, that's, <laughs> so, that's exactly. That's just make it look like what you want. Someone what would you think. have done? You think I was supposed to go to Cambridge to study British history. I was supposed to do that. I wanted to either do that or become an international art consultant and walk around and scare people and dress in all black and and and, <laughs> and, and be very intimidating. And that didn't work out for me. So, and um, I'm sure Rich would have loved going to the Met Ball. Well, I mean, think, think about it. If if Vince Doria hadn't helped me get out of Fox News and taken a he took a flyer for me because I had news experience and they wanted someone at Sports Center with news experience, then I wouldn't have met Rich and I wouldn't be sitting here with you. So I would have already known you. I would have had you in my life, but not Rich. So there you go. So it's a, it's a double win. Um, <laughs> or is it? So uh, poor Rich. But you know what's interesting about you, and she loves you too. I was talking to Lisa Salters the other night, oh, the and she came. Isn't she the best? She's Isn't the she the best? best? No, she's like, I always say this, the women that you think you can trust when you see them, you can. Tracy Wilson knows what she's doing. I mean, so many of the women that um, you feel that they know what they're doing, Michelle Tafoya, till she retired, she knew what she was doing. But um, Lisa Salters, like you, she came from news, and she has that certainty, you know, she has a real grounded, I feel like when I watch Lisa say something, I know that's right. <laughs> And she has your back at all times. And Kevin Frazier was her cameraman in Baltimore. How about that for a small world? I mean, like, oh, yeah, Kevin Frazier, who then went on to Fox Sports and now is an Entertainment Tonight host, was her cameraman. It's very incestuous, this world, isn't it? So, and Lisa Salters. I would tell you, excuse me, what I love most about it, which includes both you and Lisa Salters, is that my analogy is that when it started for women, it was this little trickle, like, you know how the Mississippi River up on the Canadian border, it's really just a tiny little stream. I went to see it one time so I could live my analogy. And then more women came, more women came. And by the time the Mississippi meets the Gulf, it is big and it is powerful and it is here to stay. And that's what gives me the most gratitude. I, I wanted to do this podcast because I feel like coming out of the last couple of years, so many people are looking for a way. They're, they're looking for guidance and they're looking for optimism and a little advice. I was lucky because I had you. I want to use this platform to show other people that it's not always easy and that there is a way. So what is your advice for everyone who is just getting started, who really wants to figure out their direction, be it? advertising, be it sports writing, be it television, 
any craft, what's your advice to them? Well, the great thing in our business is that they're all available now to young people. You can be uh, radio, you can be TV, you can be streaming, you can be uh, a host on a network, or you can be play-by-play, -play, color, whatever. It's all there for you. I would say the, the best thing besides passion, knowledge, and stamina, you know, the Ferris wheel comes down. It isn't always at the top. The best thing, uh, I think, that was useful to me is I treated every at-bat as a quality at-bat. And I remember getting a letter one time at the Globe that said, you wrote the hell out of badminton. And that gave me such a uh, pleasure. And I think that don't be looking ahead like, okay, I'll do a little bit of this and then I'll be Rich Eisen. No, <laughs> Rich Eisen is Rich Eisen because he wrote for the paper at Michigan, because he went to California, because he did, he treated every at bat as a quality at bat, same as you did. And that's, that's why I think people make it. I think you're so right. I think everybody thinks now because television is so immediate or because of reality shows or even podcasting. TikTok, what have you, people become famous without putting the work in. It's the reps, right? You don't, you don't, I mean, Jason Williams, we, you know, the old joke with white chocolate was he used to go out in the back and he would shoot 350 free throws before school and then 353 free throws at recess and what have you. And that's why he was money at the line. A hundred percent. It's, um, Malcolm Gladwell wrote, right, that you have to spend 10,000 hours and you do have to do that because it's not going to be uh, it's not, you're not going to reach the height. You're not going to be on Everest without having climbed the little hills. See, this is why podcasting is so nice. We're not speaking in 30 second intervals, right? There's no back to you. We actually get to talk for an hour. <laughs> it was a blast. <laughs> yes, thank thank you. you. I'm sure I'll talk to you within 20 seconds of it. <laughs> Exactly. Because I feel like I talk to you more than I talk to my husband these days. But by the way, that might be a good thing. Who knows? No, no. He's the best. But we have good things to say. Distracted driving is a serious problem on our roadways, leading to the deaths of thousands of people and injuries in the hundreds of thousands each year. When you take your eyes and your focus off the road, even for a second, it can be deadly. Not just for you but for other drivers, pedestrians, and bicyclists. Sadly, many Americans use their cell phones while driving, whether it's texting, checking emails, scrolling media feeds, or any other form of distraction, drivers are putting themselves and others around them at great risk. It's important to know that 48 states ban texting and driving. Also, 25 states prohibit all drivers from using cell phones while driving. Distracted drivers are not only putting people at risk, they're probably also breaking the law. Look, it is dangerous to use your cell phone behind the wheel. That's why law enforcement officers write tickets and enforce hands-free and anti-texting and driving laws. When you're driving, put your phone down. Keep your hands on the wheel, your eyes on the road, and your mind on the task of driving. Remember, you drive, you text, you pay. Brought to you by NHTSA. She's Leslie Visser. There's no one like her. Her stories are incredible. There's no one she hasn't interviewed. Well, very few anyway. Maybe Barack Obama can call in and give her a little interview on her conversation, uh, on conversation with Leslie Visser. But her book is called Sometimes You Have to Cross When It Says Don't Walk, A Memoir of Breaking Barriers. She has. She's broken every barrier that there is. And as you can tell just in listening to her conversation, she's the best person. And she is Evidence number one of how to be classy and how not to be intimidated by other people by feeling great about yourself. There's room for others to come in your wake. Next week, Angela Kinsey from the Office Ladies podcast. If you love The Office, you can't miss this one. So Angela, of course, played Angela in The Office. She is nothing like her character, but she is laugh out loud funny. And we're going to talk all about The Office, how she got started. She's going to take us behind the scenes of The Office Ladies podcast and tell some stories about The Office that maybe you haven't heard before. She'll give you some confidence on getting your career going, too. Thanks for taking in this edition of Just Getting Started. I'm Susie Schuster. I'll be back right in this chair next week.